Thanks for joining this next lecture, part of the Youth Investment Readiness Program. We're talking today with Fermin, who's going to go over perceived challenges and validation plan. Fermin, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. It's a uh, it's a great it's a great pleasure to be here and sharing uh, with all of you uh, my experience uh, in 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 this field. Um, you know, I'm sure every time uh, an entrepreneur comes up with a new idea and 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 it's it's working for it and you know pursuing it very hard and trying to make it happen and uh, go to market um, there, there, there are so many questions that I'm sure this entrepreneur has and and so many so many questions about is this going to sell uh, do people really need the product I'm selling uh, do I have a reasonable business model and the good news is that nowadays we are pretty much, we're, it, it, it's very easy, we're pretty much able to um, validate all those questions and answer all those questions way before we go to market. Maybe years ago, um, it was more difficult to do so, so uh, companies actually needed to run pilots to figure out if the, if the business model was going to be profitable, to figure out if the product was going to get some traction in the market. Uh, if, if the need uh, really existed, so it was it was really it was really uh, catastrophic if any of those questions had uh, a negative answer, and they had to you know uh, go back to the very beginning and, and start from scratch. So the good news is that nowadays, uh, thanks mainly to the internet and 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 also to uh, uh, all the developments that uh, have happened in the world of innovation and all the new methodologies uh, that that we have all embraced. We can test most of our assumptions about our business model, our product, and um, our need, and the customers' need way before we even have a, a go-to-market plan written. So uh, today we're going to be talking precisely about this: uh, before you launch any product, before you launch any new initiative experiment. And I like to begin with uh, what I have called the declaration of experimentation. These are um, key ideas that I hope you keep in mind uh, through your entrepreneurial process and, and, and especially today through uh, my session here. The, most, the first and most important one is the fact that experimentation is not for confirming, it's for learning. And this is a huge mistake that many uh, startups make. Um, when they do their testing, they think they are confirming what they have already taken for granted or what they have already assumed. But no, um, well, yeah, you, you, you may get some level of confirmation, true, but the, the experiments are, are mainly meant to uh, provide you with insight about the need, the product, the market, so you can learn and you can change, you can tweak your product or you can pivot your business model eventually if, 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 the, if the experiments show that, that, that uh, the direction you were, um, you were taking was, was, not, was, not, was not the right one. So number one, experimentation is not so much for confirming as it is for learning. Um, another very important thing about, about experimentation is that what we're doing is reducing the risk and reducing the uncertainty, but we can never reduce all the uncertainty. We can never, sorry, we can never remove all the uncertainty. We just reduce uh, uh, a little bit of it. So later, you later on in the presentation, you'll see that when we uh, prioritize um, our tests and decide what we're going to be experimenting with. Um, one of the criteria that we're going to be talking about is precisely this one. How much uncertainty are you able to remove? And of course, you have to begin with those tests that will remove the most uncertainty. Um, of course, a pilot test removes a lot of uncertainty, but it's very expensive. So the key, uh, the, the, the key message here is going to be Try to remove as much uncertainty as possible at the lowest possible cost. So, um, other thing that's quite relevant is that experimentation is not a step in a, in a, in a linear process. Um, many, many times when we talk about innovation methodology and the innovation process, we like to talk in phases and say you have the discovery phase where you get all this customer insight and all this understanding about the market. And then we have the ideation phase where you come up with the new ideas and new initiatives. And then we do the testing and then we validate and then we go and then we go to market and we and we and we 
and we um, roll out our, 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 our business model. Well, probably we say it that way to make it easier for people to understand uh, the different steps in the process, but this is not a linear process, and, and, and just, it's pretty much an iterative process where you are ideating, testing, prototyping, ideating, or perhaps the opposite, ideating, prototyping, testing, ideating, prototyping, testing. And that's, that's a, a, a process where you are continuously learning and uh, improving, refining your idea until you have an MVP that's good enough to go to market. So we're going to review this in a few in a few minutes. So I won't spend more time on this on this part of the declaration of experimentation. But there are some other things that I'd like to highlight before we we get started with the with the with the pro, with the methodology and the, the examples that I want to share with you. And this is that um, you have to you have to experiment these ideas before uh, you develop a business plan. Uh, this takes place uh, before developing the business plan. The business plan is something you may need to show to the investors so they believe in your idea and they fund it. But all this testing has to be done before the business plan because all this testing is going to condition, is going to change your business model, is going to affect your value proposition, is going to um, help you decide what is the right customer segment. And all these things are things that should be already um answered and well and, and very clearly stated in your in your in your business plan something that's also very relevant um through the experimentation process is that you have you have to be very clear about what is data and what is an assumption and you know we're all pretty optimistic when we are um when we are uh, launching up a, 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 a launching a new idea launching a startup when we are in our entrepreneurial mode I think we all tend to be very optimistic. So sometimes we may confuse data with assumptions, and uh, we have we should be very clear about that. Um, in this process, experimentation process, what we are doing is verifying assumptions, not verifying data, because data is already there. So we don't need to verify if we uh, trust this, the source of, of of the data. And the final two um, key elements of the of the experimentation process. Mm -hmm is that this is not about collecting data, it's about generating insight, meaning that we don't want to have just uh, numbers, it's not a quantitative approach to, uh, to, um, to a, uh, uh, our go-to-market or our business model. It's, it, it, it's about understanding motivations, it's about understanding attitudes, it's about understanding how uh, willing will people be to buying uh, my products, not so much what percentage of people will be buying my product. If I was, I was, uh, if I was experimenting to figure out what's the percentage of people buying my product, they will be looking for data. And, and, and that's, that's great to have, but what we're looking for here is not so much that percentage of people willing to buy my product, but why is people going to buy my project, my, my product? What is the motivation behind buying my product? What is the job they want to get done when they buy my product? That's all, that's all deep knowledge about their, 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 their motivations and their needs, even beyond what they can articulate if you, if, if you were able to ask them. And finally, experimentation, it's meant to foster decision making. All these experiments will, will provide a lot of information that should simplify your decision-making process. So I hope you have understood these seven key principles of experimentation and uh, you have internalized them. So now you're ready to, uh, now we're ready to talk about the uh, um, experimentation process. And I'd like to mm, spend two minutes just uh, um, explaining a bit more what I said before about this iterative process, uh, discovery or learning, ideation, experimentation, uh, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, today we're talking about the experiments, the testing of all the assumptions necessary to validate your solution and using some, 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 some tools that I'm going to be presenting uh, to you and that will provide you with enough information to go back to step number two and, and, and change those ideas that you have, improve those ideas, refine those ideas, so you can experiment them again. So basically we're looking at a loop between steps two and three in this, in this 
in this um, in this slide. Uh, what are we supposed to test? So we are, basically there are three things we can test. Today we're going to focus on on the first two, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning that that there are three things you can test. The number one thing we need to test is if there is a need. We need to we need to gather evidence that shows that the jobs that I want to get done for my customers matter to them. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this job to be done approach uh, that basically says that when people buy a product, they are using the product to get a job done. And uh, for us as entrepreneurs, we want to figure we need to figure out what is the job what is the job that people want us to do for them or what is the job that people is trying to get done when they come by our product. So the first thing we need to verify is actually if that job that they want to get done matters to them, if it's important to them, if there is a need. The second part that we want to test is uh, if we can deliver the product, the service that we believe it's going to satisfy that need, it's going to get that job done. So we want to collect evidence that shows that the solution that we are proposing to them, the solution that we're bringing to the table, not only is effective and efficient and relevant, but they also like it. Because it may very well be the case that the need exists, that our solution can very well satisfy that need, but people don't like it. People don't like to get the job done using the product or the service that we are offering them. So that will be a disaster. That's why it's important before we go to market to not just verify that the need exists, but also that our product, our solution is good for that need and people like it. People is going to be willing to use it. And finally, the third thing we can test is if it's worth doing all this. Are we going to make money doing all this? Are we going to attain our goals uh, if they are not uh, financial ones? Um, can we create value for the companies? Can we create value for the company? I think this is the, 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 the fundamental part of any business model is to create value for the customer and be able to keep some value for the company itself. So um, is it worth it? Are we going to be able to do this, create value for the customer and for ourselves? As I said before, we're going to focus on testing the first two needs, but um, obviously the, 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 the third one is also very important. And uh, the reason why we're not going to discuss it that much is because pretty much the, the, the solution to, to that third part, to um, validating if, if it's worth it, if we can create value, has to do with mainly with uh, financial projections and, and sales projections and then actually testing in the market. And, and that's what the, the, the goal of this session is. So that's why we're focusing on number one and number two. So let's go ahead and talk about the first problem we can solve, um, which is, is there a need? And, you know, I, I, I like to borrow this approach from um, uh, Alex Osterwalder. Um, he likes the, uh, he likes to present the need as a, as a, as a collection of three of three elements here, and I think it's a very it's a very interesting way um, to look at it. So, when we are trying to figure out if the need actually exists and is relevant for for our clients, um, what we what we have to do is have a clear understanding of the of the jobs that our customers want us to do for them, and also to learn very well what are the painful situations that they are confronting when they try to get the job done today with existing solutions. Um, I guess the, I guess the, the, the underlying message be, be, be behind what I'm saying is that people basically get their jobs done. One way or the other, they get their jobs done. And the jobs, their needs are there and they get them done. The thing is that those may, the, the thing is that um, they may be using a not very effective solution. And that's why they find it painful to get that job done. And they find they confront some painful situations as they try to get the job done. Um, but they also see some potential gains in the process. They are trying to get their job done using whatever is available for them, and they see what would they like. To, what they see what they would like to see. They, they, they understand what they would like to see. There are some gains, some extra benefits that they would appreciate. So, taking taking these three 
um, connecting those three components, what is the job that people want to get done? What are the painful situations that um, they are confronting nowadays when they try to get the job done? And what are the benefits, the extra benefits, what are the gains that they would like to see uh, in the process are a great starting point for uh, experimentation. All we have to do is figure out what are the assumptions behind each of these three components. Once I have laid out very clearly the job, the customer jobs, the current pains and the current gains, then I have to ask myself, what are the assumptions underlying behind each of these things I'm saying here? What are the, 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 the base, what, am, what am I taking for granted? What am I assuming um, um, when I when I when I um, when I say that this is a customer, this is the job that customers want to get done. These are the pains they have, and these are the gains they would appreciate. With regard to um, can we deliver? What is the product? Um, again, borrowing from Alex Osterwalder, this is a very interesting way to present your value proposition. And again, it has three, three components. Your value proposition is composed of three things. The products and services, or the connection or bundle of products and services you're going to offer that are meant basically to get those jobs done. There's a direct connection between the customer jobs in this slide and the product and services in this other slide. But also, you have to include those pain relievers and gain creators that are going to, number one, remove the pains that we have identified in existing solutions, and number two, create the benefits that we know people would appreciate on top of the existing solutions. So again, what I have here is a list of products and services, of potential, of, of, of how am I going to create the gains, and how am I going to remove the pains. And then, all I have to do is figure out what are the underlying assumptions under each of these components of the value proposition. So I am somehow um, already uh, sharing with you uh, the first step of the experimentation process, which is to extract the assumptions. But of course, we have to extract assumptions from somewhere. And my suggestion here is to uh, use the value proposition canvas by Alex Osterwalder to extract the needs from the customer jobs, the gains and the pains, and extract the assumptions about the, our solution from the game creators, the pain relievers, and the product and services that are going to compose my value proposition. Once I have the uh, assumptions, um, the key assumptions that um, I think are relevant to the, to, the, to the model, I need to prioritize them because not all of them are as relevant. So um, I need to figure out what are, which are the ones that I need to test, which are the ones that I must test before I can move forward. Once I have figured out what are those uh, hypotheses that I'm going to test, the next step, obviously, is to design a test, and then, obviously, to run it. Then it's to uh, learn from the test. I'm sorry, you can see there's a typo here in my slide. Um, number five should not say extract assumptions, uh, should say learn from, their, from the test. And then we can go ahead and, 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 and make progress. So let's focus on one, two, and three. How do we extract assumptions? How do, I, how do we prioritize the hypotheses? And how do we sign, how do we sign the, text, the test? So um, as far as the uh, assumptions extraction um, is concerned. Um, I've, 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 I've pretty much explained already how I think uh, um, is what's what's what I think is the best way and easiest way to do it. Um, with regard to the to the to the need, um, we need to figure out what needs to be true for the job to be done to re to be relevant for customers, so they're willing to pay for it. When I state the job to be done that I think the client has, what needs to be true? to prove that that is relevant. We'll see a couple examples later so you understand much better what I'm talking about. Uh, what do we think are the customer dislikes and, 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 and pains? Why do we think they don't like those things? Or why do we think the customer will appreciate the gains? So it's not actually asking you what are the gains, what are the pains, what are the jobs? You've done that before. 
uh, you've done that during the discovery phase. You have them in your in your in your um, um, value proposition canvas if you've used uh, this tool. What you have to ask yourself to identify the assumptions is the question: Why is this true? Or what needs to be true for this to happen? And it's exact same situation with the with the solution. Uh, you have it framed with your products and services, your gain creators, your pain relievers, and now you have to ask what needs to be true for these products and services to actually del for for them to actually deliver the job to be done. And what are these pain creators? Why why are these pain creators going to uh, sorry? What are, why are these pain relievers going to relieve the pains? And why are these gain creators going to create the gains so it's a matter of asking yourself why and then you can also extract assumptions about uh the the the, the core uh, value creation but we said uh we were not going to focus on this this is basically um figuring out what are the assumptions in the financial model to verify that in your cost structure and your revenue stream and figure out if 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 the model is sustainable Let's talk a little bit about prioritization before we, 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 we describe uh, um, a few examples. Um, well, the goal here is that you know you have you have some assumptions that you have extracted from your from your uh, value proposition and from the need, and you need to figure out uh, which are the ones that are worth experimenting. Experimentation takes time, it takes time, takes uh, some money. It's, it's not supposed to be expensive. But it does entail some cost, so it's it's important to prioritize and decide what you want to do first. So uh, let me go to this slide directly um, and 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 explain what are the three criteria that we use to prioritize uh, the hypothesis from the need uh, and the and the and the value proposition. So basically, we look at three things. We look at the level of uncertainty that the experiment will remove from my model and we look at the impact that um, that hypothesis has in the overall success of the business model there are some assumptions that if they are proven wrong they will be a big game changer there are some assumptions that if they are proven wrong they have a very high impact in our business model and we have to change it dramatically while there are other assumptions that even if they're proven wrong, that will have a very little impact in our model. Um, at the same time, some assumptions uh, will be able to, uh, if we prove, there are some assumptions, uh, assumptions that if we are, um, if we prove them, if we verify them, uh, we will be removing a lot of uncertainty. And there are others that uh, unfortunately, even if we verify the assumption, the level of uncertainty that we, that we remove um, will be little. So here we clearly identify three zones. Uh, zone one are the assumptions that you should test right away, where you have a lot of uncertainty and, a lot, and, and, and those assumptions have a high impact um, on the model. Then we have zone two. These are the assumptions that you can test next in a second, in a second round. Uh, here we have assumptions that um, have less impact and that uh, will allow us to reduce the uncertainty to a lesser degree than, than, than before if we verify them. And then in zone three, we have the assumptions that we may never test uh, unless we have a lot of time and money uh, because you know, those assumptions, they have little impact in the model and the amount of uh, uncertainty they remove is not, is, not, is not a lot, it's not a great deal. So here we have two key um, uh, criteria. Um, to, to prioritize hypotheses. And we also like to introduce a third one. A third one that is about how easy it is to test the hypothesis. So we think that um, you have to try first those hypotheses that are easier to test or that you can test faster or you can test at a, at a, at a, at a lesser cost. So if we're looking at, at, at assumptions in zone one, zone two, zone three, you should first of all test an assumption in zone one where you remove a lot of, a lot of uncertainty on assumptions that have high impact, but with a low cost or a low, um, 
um, difficulty in terms of experimenting. Um, number two, the second assumption that you should, that you should uh, experiment is not an assumption in the zone one. It's an assumption in zone two, one, two. Why? Because here we're saying, all right, we'd rather test something in zone two, in zone two that is easy to test, something that has little cost and little time and little effort, than trying to uh, um, verify something that, you know, although being on zone, in zone one, is much more complicated to, to, to test. So we, we, we begin with zone one that are easy to test, we continue with zone two that are easy to test, but then instead of going to zone three, easy to test, we go back to zone one and start doing the one that's not so easy to test and then to zone two, um, the one that's not so easy to test. Most times we test just two things, two assumptions, uh, the two key assumptions. So we always end up testing one in zone one and one in, in, in zone two. So I hope this is clear. A lot of information in, in, in just 30 minutes about experimentation. Uh, I'd just like to review here this iterative process that we mentioned before. So we're all clear um, what we're talking about. And just to, just to sum up some of the things we've said so far. So you start with your customer insight you figure out what is the need or job to be done for the client. You figure out a value proposition concept, your value proposition. You ideate a value proposition. And the first thing you do is a conceptual test. And, uh, and, there, are, and, and there, are, there, are, there are there are tools specially designed that we're going to review in a second for this conceptual test. And once you have this concept test and you get the results from that concept test, you have an MVP. MVP that you can prototype on a low fidelity prototype that you're going to test that will help you create a medium fidelity prototype that you will test and will help you um, refine your value proposition to create a high fidelity prototype that you will finally test to finally obtain your go-to-market minimum viable product. So this is why we refer to this process as iterative, because you're going back and forth from testing to a better version, a much a, a higher fidelity version of your product. What's important in this slide is that there are two different types of tests, overall speaking. Those that are better suited for the concept test phase, where you are, uh, where you don't yet have, you know, where, where you don't have yet a, a, a minimum viable product. And those are the tests where you're actually already, where you already have something that you can test in the market. Let's take a look at all the different um, experiments, uh, sorry, um, test tools that, that, that we use. Um, we won't have time today to, to describe all of them, um, but we're going to talk about uh, them a little bit in the, in the examples that we have, although the, the, the description of all these tests is in the presentation that you're gonna have access to. But let's say that there are some tests that are better for conceptual testing. For example, um, talk to customers. You don't need a prototype. You don't need, sorry, you don't need an MVP. You just need a, a, a two-dimensional prototype and you can run any of these um, creative games, speedboat, product box, buy a feature. All these are uh, what we call creative games that, that are, are, are easy to, to implement. Uh, the description of those is in the presentation, so uh, no need to spend time. Um, on that, um, you can you can you, you can also you can also do desk research. Uh, you can run thought experiments. So you 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 you, you, you talk to a couple um, customers and and you make them walk the, walk you through the process of them uh, filling the need and trying to satisfy it and 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 seeing how their their as they progress through their progress through their journey and they tell you. Um, how they do things, you can figure out if, if you are actually, you know, if your solution is actually um, making things, would be, would be actually making things easier for them or not. You can also talk to an expert. You can simulate a transaction. These are good examples of tests for, the, for, for testing the concept. Once we, once we have the concept transforming MVP, and we have the MVP transformed in a low fidelity prototype and then a medium fidelity and then a high fidelity prototype. Then 
we can start using other types of experiments, for example, A-B testing, where you run two different types of prototypes and you maybe uh, you show them online. You, you run a Facebook campaign uh, with different banners um, that, that would take you to different landing pages. And in each landing page, you present a slightly different product. And you ask people to sign up for a future release or to uh, pre-buy the product uh, or even to buy it. Um, as long as you tell them later on that, that you are not able to deliver it, so uh, you are not taking money from them, it should be okay. So um, these are tests that are more suited for the um, MVP, um, low, medium, high fidelity prototype phase. So we have a description here of each of the tests that we mentioned before. Um, um, I don't think there's a need to go through all of them right now. You will have them in the documents of this session, from this session, so um, you can take a look at it. Uh, and they're pretty much self-explanatory. I'd rather go to explain um, a few case studies and and and, um, and maybe describe the experiments that that we did for 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 those projects. These are these are actual these are real projects that we've done, um, and these are the actual experiments that we run for the client. And the and the um, outcome from 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 those experiments. So this is a financial institution. Uh, they offer uh, term loans to the AM banked, and they wanted to expand its product portfolio. So basically, this is a base of the pyramid uh, lending, and they're just doing uh, one type of loan, and they wanted to see what what other types of loans um, that people needed. So. We have we we struck a couple. There were a couple of assumptions that we wanted to test uh, with regard to the need. One of the things we had said was that uh, the reason for people to ask for a loan, uh, people at the base of the pyramid to ask for a loan at this financial institution instead of going to friends and relatives and and and, and loan sharks, um, was on top of you know the financial. Um, concerns or the the interest rate, etc. Uh, another reason for for um, um, applying for a loan with with this financial institution is because they were providing um, they were providing credit information to the credit bureaus here in the U.S. So by getting a loan from this financial institution, these people at the base of the pyramid were actually beginning to build a credit record. And um, we weren't sure if this mattered to them or not. So this was an assumption that we wanted to test. And the other assumption we wanted to test was uh, whether people liked or not more flexible loan facilities. I mean, this, this term loan was pretty nice. But it was pretty rigid, like three months, uh, fixed rate, and, and very fixed uh, amounts. So uh, limited amounts. So um, would people appreciate uh, a more flexible loan facility? And with regard to the value proposition, um, we were debating if those, if the new loans had to be longer term, shorter term, if we needed to create some new, some new financial um, uh, lending products that did not exist. So we wanted to uh, test whether people preferred long term or short term, uh, regardless of the amount. Um, and finally, there was also this thing when lending money to small businesses uh, in the base of the pyramid to figure out if uh, borrowing from invoices could be a possibility. I mean, the, what we mean here is that we know all these small businesses, informal businesses uh, from people at the base of the pyramid, they do get, they do get, um, they do get a lot of you know sales traffic, and 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 they can prove how much sales, how, how many sales they 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 they, they have on, a, on on any given day, and we were wondering if we could connect the loans to this to to to, to their sales uh, volume more than to their uh, final profit. So this was something that we wanted to test too. So we prioritized the hypothesis based on the uncertainty that was going to be removed and the impact. And the test now uh, was a 1B and, 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 and 2B, uh, and the test next was, was 2A. So this is um, the test that we designed. So for 2B, for example, um, figuring out if people were willing to borrow on, on invoices, we simulated an online application process for invoice factoring and merchant cash advance. These were two products that we wanted to test. So we actually run 
a, an all, a, a simulated an online application uh, on this company's website. Um, it looked like you were applying for a product. It sounded like you were applying for a product, but at the end of the process, you actually you were not asking for anything confidential. We we're just saying something like, would you like to apply for a um, cash advance, merchant cash advance solution? Or would you like to apply for invoice factoring solution? And people clicked yes. We, we, we asked them the amounts, we asked them the terms, we asked them what they wanted the money for. Um, and then when they said next, uh, we, would, we, we would just say, uh, happy to know what your needs are. We don't have this product right now available, but we'll let you know the minute we have it. And um, we asked them to provide us with their email address in case they wanted us to update them the next time we had this product available. So I don't think anybody felt cheated because we were not saying it was an application, although it sounded like an application. And we learned uh, based on the number of clicks in each of these two products that we advertised for a limited period of time, which of the two uh, could get more traction in the market. Um, 2A, um, wondering whether people prefer longer terms um, regardless of the, the amount. We did a, an email campaign to existing clients. This company had already uh, a large number of clients. So we sent an email uh, offering the possibility to extend their maturity dates if they met some undisclosed conditions. The reason why the undisclosed condition, the reason why the conditions were undisclosed uh, was because um, if they said yes, I want to extend my my um, I want to extend the maturity date. We we wanted to be able to say you don't meet the conditions. So that's why they were undisclosed. That's a little bit tricky. It's, we are in gray gray waters here, maybe. <laughs> but um, we 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 got lucky, and 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 the people that asked for a an extension, they 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 could actually get it. So uh, the financial institution ended up offering the extensions to the one to the ones that said that they wanted it. But overall, we didn't get too many positive responses. So um, uh, longer terms was was not was not the solution. And um, finally, with regard to the to the need hypothesis one uh, B, um, we wanted to we wanted to figure out whether people um, liked or not more flexible loan facilities. So what we did is that we allowed new applicants to request different terms on loan amounts on top of the starter ones. So when we got a new application on top of the standard amounts uh, and terms. We asked them, is there any other specific term or amount that will that will um, serve you better? And and um, it was not binding for us. We didn't have to, you know, to uh, to um, satisfy what what their need or what they were saying. But at least we were gathering information. So very simple test, just to understand um, whether people um, preferred or not more flexible facilities. Um, I have. Two more examples. I don't know if, um, if, if this should should I go to the to the next two or uh, is it about a good time to um, open the, the the mic for Q and A, uh, Lauren? How do you think we should do it? Um, I think we should do two more examples. I think that would be helpful. Okay, let's go for it then. So. This is Sun Edison. This is a company in India. This is not our project. Like um, we got this from, um, we haven't done this. So this is something that we learned um, from some book. But I thought it was interesting um, what they were doing and the the, the assumptions and the prioritization, prioritization and the tests design. This is something we've done in house, but um, the project itself uh, was not one of our projects. So Sun Edison is selling solar cell panels to mid large organizations so they can generate electricity for their use. So basically, you have this this big boxes, big box stores uh, in India with a huge uh, roofs. So uh, because the electricity supply is not very reliable in some regions, why don't, um, why, how about installing some solar cell panels on the roof so the companies can generate their own electricity and rely on their own production for their commercial needs. So again, the assumptions in the model, the need, uh, people need a guaranteed electricity supply. And also we at the time, um, you know, it could be discussed that doing this, by doing this, by generating its own um, energy, 
uh, a company could be perceived as more green, as more environmentally friendly. So this could have been a concern. This could have been something in the value proposition. So we thought it would be worth testing that, that need. Um, with regard to the value proposition, um, the main question was, is, is, everybody, is, 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 is there a good disposition by business to invest today to save tomorrow? Because basically, um, you know, installing solar cell panels in your roof, it's great, but it takes a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's a big investment and you are, you are not going to benefit from that investment in the short term. You're going to benefit little by little uh, with every monthly um, utility bill that you don't pay. So you may have to invest twenty thousand today, and you just have a you know a, a utility bill reduction of twenty dollars for the next X months. So um, were, were businesses willing to do this? And the other one, um, we're wondering if the solar panels uh, were easy to install uh, on on the big box uh, stores and, and and warehouses without without you know um, interfering with the commercial um, activity. Um, in, in those in those um, in those stores, uh, again we we prioritized the, the hypothesis and one A, two A, and two B were the ones that we wanted to uh, discuss more. One um, A, two A, one B uh, are the ones we we would design tests for. We design tests for, and um, let's go for it. So, uh, the hypothesis one uh, A um, guaranteed electricity supply is a need. So, what we did, we opened. Oh, oh no, sorry, we didn't do this. Uh, we, what we suggested that could be done um, could be to open a complaints hotline and report electricity outages with the skews of using it to push authorities to take action. So, as a company, if I'm a company and I'm thinking whether I want to install solar panels uh, of not or not and and you know i'm san edison i'm trying to sell those uh those solar panels what i can do is i can open a complaint hotline just you know a number that i can that i can publish everywhere so every time a company um has a problem with electricity supply they can call me uh i take the complaint and and then with all those complaints I, I'm, I'm supposed to go to the government to share with them that all these companies over the course of these months have complained about the um, electricity outages. That's great, you know, collecting all the complaints and taking them to the government, that's great. But in the meantime, I'm also learning. I'm also learning how many companies are complaining about electricity outages. So that's some sort of experiment that gives me the information I need while also doing some good for the community. Um, this is great. And the parameter would be, of course, how many complaints received from the local businesses. Hypothesis 2A, um, overall disposition by businesses to invest today to save tomorrow. We could have done a direct marketing campaign offering businesses to pay in advance for two years of electricity in, uh, uh, in exchange for a lower kilowatt rate. That's the same thing as the uh, solar cell panel investment. Um, you pay, you, you invest in solar cell panels today and um, you get a reduction in your bill for the next 10 years. What we're saying here is, okay, we, we, we run a campaign offering people to pay the electricity um, for two years today, like a lump sum, like one payment uh, for two years of electricity average consumption uh, in exchange for a lower rate during those years. So the difference between the two, I mean, there's just conceptually, there's no difference between the two. You have to pay more today to pay less in the future. And in terms of testing, uh, this is a much easier, this is something much easier to do because you just have to offer it. You just offer this direct marketing through this direct marketing campaign, this possibility, but you don't need to invest in the solar cell panels. It's, it's, it's a financial product. So it's, 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 it much, it's a contract, which is much easier to, rep, to, to, to do and, 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 to, and to execute. So that's why um, we thought this could be a nice way to prove whether people are willing to pay more today to pay less in the future. And finally, uh, 1B, um, uh, if you want to be perceived as a green company, um, we, the, 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 the test here would be something as simple as an online survey um, offering the opportunity to monetize large roof surfaces by installing solar panels. So actually what we're doing here is offering our service we hope before we have it. Um, you can call it pre-sales, you can call it mock sales, you're just, before you actually have the capacity to do it, you can run like a market test, offering it to as many companies as you want and just checking how many um, accept your offer. 
So just some very simple tests to prove the, the hypothesis that we have um, like there, that, that we have um, extracted. And finally, uh, I love this one. This is something we did in Mexico uh, a few years ago. It's a, it's an, um, a petrol company, a um, gasoline company. They wanted to experiment if a premium diesel uh, could be a good product to sell. They had created premium diesel at a technology center and the rationale behind the premium diesel is that it was better for your engine and uh, and your engine would perform better um, in terms of speed and power and, and, and all those all those things so the assumptions we wanted to test uh, people is willing to pay more for a premium diesel people is willing to pay more in exchange for higher performance and longer longer engine life um, and also we wanted to prove that people feel that regular fuels are not good enough that they don't like what they have so there's a need for a for a um, for a premium one and with regard to the value proposition we wanted to prove that drivers value uh, a longer healthier engine life over a shorter um, not so healthier life though at a cheaper price and also that drivers um, think that premium fuels improve performance and power. Uh, we wanted to see if there was a connection there, if people connect the quality of the fuel with the quality, with the, with the, with the engine performance and engine life. And uh, also talking about drivers of environmental responsibility. But we finally, because of the prioritization we did, we ended up testing 1A, 2A, 1B. And 1A was my favorite. Um, basically, we, we installed a mock fuel dispenser uh, at, at, a, at a pump. So um, we went to a selected uh, number of gas stations. I think it was like 10 gas stations. And at each pump, we, we installed a, a mock fuel dispenser that said premium diesel. And it said premium diesel and had a price and you had a, you had a pump there. And actually, we, we counted how many times people um, took the pump and tried to pump uh, this premium fuel into the cars um, just to see a sign saying uh, that, it's, that it was not available, that, 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 that it had, that, 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 that uh, premium fuel was not available at that pump. Um, it was great because that was a great experiment because people were seeing the, 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 the product there. They, 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 they were seeing that there was a premium diesel and they were able to, to, to actually grab the hose and try to try to fuel, try to pump it into their cars. And it was just at the very end that they realized they couldn't do it. And you know, the, people understand that sometimes you don't have the fuel you need in the gas station. So frustration levels were very, very low. People just, you know, brought the hose back to the pump and just take just took a new hose and added the, the standard, the standard diesel. But it was quite illustrative and it was very good to test um, this hypothesis. We also did a study uh, to learn how long do people hold on to their cars on average, like a like a survey. A uh, very easy, very easy way to experiment, and we also ran a poll at gas stations with clients using a standard diesel. So we actually talked to the customers uh, while as they were pumping diesel into the cars to learn how they liked the diesel, um, if they thought you know they wanted to improve their 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 their, their, their get a better fuel to improve their their um, engine performance and well all the things we said before. So very interesting, very interesting um, uh, tests and, and, and a quite successful, quite successful project that led the company to uh, not launch the premium diesel. Apparently, um, the public was not going to appreciate it uh, enough uh, to pay the extra price. And um, I'm giving it back to you, uh, Lauren. I think this is pretty much uh, what I had uh, here today uh, for this session. Thanks so much. That was a great and very clear presentation. Um, I hope so. <laughs> Too many things in 30 minutes, 40 minutes. <laughs> yes, it is a lot of content. Um, I'm curious to hear, I think maybe, uh, well, I guess I have two questions and I think they're sort of related. So I love this last example you presented with the diesel fuel uh, possible product. Um, and I particularly like this one for a couple reasons. One of them being that um, actually the assumptions that they were making that people would, you know, be willing to pay more for this and, and that it was a useful product were not uh, confirmed and they ended up not marketing this product. 
Um, I'm wondering if there's a more concrete example or a different example you could use where perhaps some of the assumptions were confirmed and others were not. And uh, an example of the more iterative kind of a circle of testing and retesting that you presented. Can, do you have an example of that? Um, and then maybe related to that as well, um, you know, I'm curious as well if you have maybe any famous examples of companies that either did a really great job um, validating their assumptions or any famous failures of companies that put a product out on the market that um, failed perhaps because they didn't effectively do this kind of iterative model. So I guess that's three parts, sort of an example of the more iterative uh, way that this could work, and then maybe like a, a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let me let me bring us back here to the to this image. This is the one you are you are referring to, right? The more iterative process, and and it's it's it's. I'm, I'm happy you asked that because we just finished a project a couple of weeks ago. Um, that has nothing to do with oil. I hope it doesn't matter. Um, it has to do with olive oil. <laughs> so it's not it's not fuel, but it's a, a different kind of oil. So um, uh, it was very interesting. We were this company. Um, they they produce a top extra virgin olive oil, and we were creating a new uh, olive oil that's specific for frying. Um, the problem with frying with olive oil is that. Uh, you don't get the, the high temperatures you need sometimes to to do deep frying. If you want to, if like especially here in the U.S., if you want to do a fried chicken and you want to deep fry uh, your chicken and you want the butter the butter to 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 be very crispy, you need very high temperatures. And the extra virgin olive oil is not very good at high temperatures because it, it, you get too much smoke. So um, we're helping them create the perfect olive oil for frying. Right. So. Um, We've done everything from the conceptual test to the high fidelity um, prototype. Um, the conceptual test, uh, at the concept test level, we we're trying to prove if people really needed uh, olive oil for frying, if people really needed that, or if they were happy using canola oil or, or using other types of oil. So the way we did this was just by um, participating in different, in different uh, cooking forums. So uh, we had a team of people just uh, participating in different uh, cook forums, talking about frying and asking questions to people, asking, "Hey, I need to fry this. Uh, I, I want to make this fried chicken. Uh, which which olive, which oil should I use?" And people were saying canola. People were saying avocado oil or uh, grape seed, I think it was. And 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 um, and so our person, uh, our, our secret uh, blogger or secret uh, forum participant, would say, "Hey, how about olive oil?" Um, and you know, so they struck these conversations and, and uh, all these conversations online. And we also did a bit of social media scanning too, uh, took us to an MVP. So this MVP was actually um, not yet um, an oil that you could use, but it, it, it was it, it had a compass. We, we figured out what the composition of that olive oil would be, what the packaging would be, and we did a low fidelity prototype that we tested, um, showing it to people on the streets. So. Um, we went to places where people buy uh, cooking appliance, cooking appliances, or cooking things for cooking. You know, like like you know utensils, things like that. And we showed them a, a, a picture of these of these uh, of these um, uh, olive oil, olive oil, specially made designed for frying, to gather the insight. And that helped us go to a medium fidelity product product that was actually an oil. And and um, we were able to test it uh, in 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 a pop up store. Uh, not a pop-up store, a pop-up stand in in a farmer market. Uh, so we went to, uh, to we went to the Upper West here, the Upper West uh, um, side in in New York City near 80th Street, and for uh, three consecutive weekends we had a stand where, on top of selling other olive oils, we were testing this one and saying that it was good for frying and getting feedback from people, and that helped us create a high fidelity uh, model, high fidelity olive oil product that is actually right now in process of production and it includes all the packaging and all the naming and all the and all the product positioning and everything. So uh, this is an interesting project that we've done recently that, where we've gone through the full process. I hope I've answered the first question. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, and with regard to the other two,
to uh, easier to understand, e easier to begin with some failures. Um, one of my favorites is it's um, uh, a local brand of beer, uh, Coors, Coors Beer. Uh, so Coors Beer has always said that they are Rocky Mountain water beer. So basically what their claim is that their beer is, is, is made with uh, Rocky Mountain water. And uh, they made this assumption that if people liked Coors beer because it was made with Rocky Mountain water, they would also love their Rocky Mountain water by itself without the beer component, just the water. So they didn't, they didn't test it. They just took for granted that they were right and that that assumption was, was, was good. And they launched uh, Rocky Mountain water. And it was a huge um, failure. Um, they had to, they, 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 the market did not connect the brand Coors with uh, Rocky Mountain water. And um, they had to, they had to, um, they had to remove it from, from the market. Um, that's a bad example. That's an example of when it didn't work. And um, when it worked, uh, there are a few cameras right now on the market done by Polaroid, uh, where we've done a lot of testing. Um, I, cannot, I cannot talk too much about it because of the um, non-disclosure agreements that we have. But there are a few, cam few Polaroid cameras in the market that uh, we've tested extensively in terms of uh, user experience and user interface and, and how the clients interact with the camera that we've, we've done through what we've gone through all the uh, iterative process from 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 initial a uh, low fidelity um ux uh ux um ux um, sketches all the way down to um, high fidelity apps uh where we had people interacting with them and and uh, i think now we have the the right version and the cameras are uh, are are being sold in the market and as far as i understand they are they're pretty successful so that would be my example of something done well great that's fantastic that's very helpful um thank you <laughs> so i think we're at time and unless there are any other burning questions i would say we'll wrap up All right. So thank you so much. We really appreciate your expertise that you've shared with us today, Furman. And um, just a note to thank anybody who's watching this video online after we've posted it. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. My pleasure.